be verses 15 through 17. And I'll ask you if you're able to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, where you're seated is fine. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is writing. He says, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let, verse 16, the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And, verse 17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Would you pray with me as we ask God's blessing on our understanding? Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for your word in this portion that we have before us here this morning. But Lord, we're also keenly aware that unless the Holy Spirit gets our attention and holds our attention, we're going to miss what it is that you have for us here in your word. Lord, that's why we're here. We're here because we hunger and thirst for you, knowing only you can satiate that hunger and that thirst that we have. So Lord, will you speak into our lives, in and through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I want to talk with you today about how it is that we as Christians can know the will of God. This is without a doubt, the most often asked question I get as a pastor. That of, how do I know what God's will is? The good news is that the text before us today provides us with what I'll call a three-pronged approach to knowing what God's will is. And before we jump into this, I want to say this because I know that it will be a huge help to you this morning, as it has been to me in my walk with the Lord. This is so important. If you hear nothing else that I say today, you need to hear this. God wants you in His will more than even you yourself want to be in His will. Let me say the same thing in a different way. God is never going to put you in a position in your life, in the circumstances in your life, that is not conducive to you doing what His will is for you. And we're going to see that here today. Never think for a moment that God is in heaven trying to play this chess game with us, to keep us from figuring out what His will is. He wants us in His will. He wants us to know what His will for our lives is. Okay, here's the first one. It's in verse 15. It's the peace of God. This is interesting because Paul starts out by saying, let He says it twice, actually, but he says, let. In other words, (laughs) the onus is on us to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. And that word rule is a very interesting word in the original language of the Greek New Testament. It carries with it the idea 
of a referee, or if you prefer, an umpire who basically calls the shots. In other words, what Paul is saying here is, let the umpire of the Holy Spirit make the call as to whether or not it's right or wrong, good or bad, fair or foul, in or out. In other words, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the peace that only God can give. And sometimes that peace is inexplicable, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Sometimes the circumstances in our lives are such that there is just such disorder, even confusion, perhaps chaos. And God in the midst of that, I'll even say despite that, can give us the peace that Paul says will transcend our understanding, to keep our hearts and our minds at peace in Christ. In other words, it's this sense that even though everything around me makes no sense, I still have this peace. One of the things I'm learning in my walk with the Lord is to never go against that check that God puts in your heart. It's that sense that something's just not quite right. I don't have a peace about it, we'll say. That's the Holy Spirit giving you a pause instead of peace. That's the Holy Spirit giving you a a check. And sometimes it's no, sometimes it's stop, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's wait. But there's no peace and God will not give you that peace to move forward until it is in His will and in His way, and in His time. Turn to James chapter 3. I want to read verses 14 through 18. This is a great template, if I can say it like that, when it comes to the will of God, knowing the will of God. It's like a a grid, maybe a filter, if you prefer, that you can run everything through to be able to discern whether or not this is God or not. Listen to what James says, verse 14. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Don't go against that. This wisdom, verse 15, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Satan, we know, is the author of confusion. Now, verse 17, by contrast, James writes, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now, verse 18, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So you're facing a decision here this morning. It's a major decision. And you want to know what God's will is. Run it through the grid of what James says here. First of all, are your motives pure? Is there that peace that God is giving you? Is is it something that would cause you to be submissive, willing to yield, gentle, full of mercy, good fruits, no no hypocrisy, no partiality? Or is that decision 
that you're about to make riddled with self-seeking, selfish motives? Is there envy, covetousness? Run it through this template and don't move until you have that peace. And that peace sometimes comes by way of the Holy Spirit in that still small voice, bearing witness with your spirit that this is the way, walk ye in it. It is good between me and the Holy Spirit. There's just a a peace about it. This brings us to the second one. And by the way, all three of these, they work in concert one with the other. Nothing can be standalone, as we'll see here in a moment. In verse 16, we have our second way to know God's will, and it's by way of the Word of God. After Paul says, let the peace of God rule in your heart, he then says, let the Word of God rule in your heart. And what he's saying is the peace of God must be confirmed by the Word of God. Here's the thing. God's Word will never contradict God's will. Conversely, God's will will never contradict God's Word. You can be rest assured (laughs) that it's not the will of the Lord for your life if it goes against the Word of God. So the Word of God confirms the peace of God. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It it sheds light on the situation, on that decision, when you're at that crossroad of decision. The Word of God speaks to that. It's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and surgically so. And by that I mean there's a specific word in God's Word that is for you, where God will speak into your life, in and through His Word concerning His will. This brings us to the third one. Once we have the peace of God, it's confirmed by the Word of God. The will of God can be known by the providence of God. The providence of God is when God opens and closes doors. He orchestrates the circumstances, choreographs the steps, as He leads us in the path that He would have us to go. We get into trouble when we place too much emphasis on the circumstances. And sometimes we miss the will of God, and we misinterpret and misunderstand the will of God based on the circumstances in our lives. And what I mean by that is is that sometimes when things aren't going well, we interpret that as, well, I must not be in God's will. You can be right smack in the middle of the trial of your life, and also be right smack in the middle of God's will for your life. I think of the disciples in the midst of the Sea of Galilee in that storm. Jesus sent them into the boat, into the Sea of Galilee to get to the other side. Oh, by the way, spoiler alert, they make it to the other side. They didn't think they were going to make it to the other side. When the storm hit, suddenly, out of nowhere, you might be in a storm in your life right now. Don't let that determine the will of God for your life. In fact, I would even venture to say that you might be in that storm because God is actually not only directing you, but redirecting you. So here you are, you're in this trial, this difficulty, this hardship, 
And what is our first response to something like that? God must be mad at me. God must be punishing me. I must be out of God's will. No, not necessarily. In fact, this might be the very thing that God has allowed in order to get you to where He wants to get you. The year was 2002. (laughs) And that's exactly what God did in my life. I'm on the mainland. I have a church that I planted. I'm the pastor of the church. And everything was going just great. And then all of a sudden, God just began to make things not so great. (laughs) You know, sometimes we get too comfortable in point A, and God sees that. You've perhaps, I'm sure, heard that, of course, God will comfort the afflicted, but sometimes God will afflict the comfortable. We get too comfortable, too complacent, too content. And so God has to send a storm, because there's no way He would ever get us to consider point B if we're too comfortable in point A. So He's going to disrupt point A to even get us to consider point B. Well, that's exactly what happened. All of a sudden I began to see that God was wanting to do something different. And I was so rooted there in that place on the mainland. And it was really something that I would have never otherwise considered had God not allowed what He allowed to happen. And so when I began to sense that maybe God was moving me to Oahu, (laughs) here am I, Lord, send me. (laughs) Someone has to do it, right? When the Lord calls you, you want Him to call you to a place like this. But I sensed that God was going to close that chapter, close that door, and open up another door. And in 2003, we would come here to start what is this church, now some 16 years later. As they say, the rest is history. But had it not been for the circumstances that God arranged, I would have never even considered a move like this. This is where prayer comes in, such that we seek the Lord to reveal to us what His will is for us. This is Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. I know you all know this well. We sing this, we memorize this. But I want to point something out in this that maybe you haven't seen before. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Let's uh, let's kind of look at this a little bit closer. Three things. If we want the Lord to direct our paths, there are three prerequisites, if you please. The first of which is to trust the Lord with all your heart, not half-hearted. This has to be a complete trust by faith in the Lord. I'm trusting you, Lord. I have to. (laughs) This is a huge step of faith. The second one, lean not on your own understanding. I think that's interesting. And here's why. Isn't it true that when we do understand, we don't lean on Him? Because we have understanding. When is it that we 
lean on the Lord, trust in the Lord, it's when we don't understand. Guess what? There are going to come into our lives those circumstances that make absolutely no sense. Lord, I don't understand what's going on. Good. That's the point. I've got you right where I need you. Because when you do understand, you don't look to me. You don't lean on me. You don't trust in me. You've got this thing figured out. So I'm going to allow these perplexing set of circumstances and it's going to make no sense to you at all. I know that when we moved from Spokane, Washington to Kailua, we left one of the most inexpensive places on the planet to live to one of the most expensive places on the planet to move. And we hadn't even sold our house yet. In fact, it took one year after we moved here for our house to sell. I don't even want to tell you what it sold for. You'll cry. Okay, I'm going to tell you because I'm going to cry. <laughs> sold it for $165,000. You can't buy a toilet in Hawaii for $160,000. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if that was a little bit. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> This makes no sense. Oh, looks like you're going to have to trust me. Yes, I'm going to have to trust you. And then thirdly, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. In other words, <laughs> in all of the ways that you go, in everything that you do, acknowledge Him, seek Him. That's prayer. When is it that we pray? Isn't it when we don't understand? Isn't it when we have to trust? I mean, here we are in this fork in the road. And as Yogi Berra famously said, when you get to that fork in the road, take it. Thank you so much. That helps so much. Which way should I go, Lord? To the right, to the left? Should I move forward? Should I wait? You know, sometimes, I mean, please know that when we pray, God will always answer your prayer. But God will not always answer your prayer the way you want God to answer your prayer, and at the time that you want God to answer your prayer. He's either going to answer with yes. I love it when he says yes. Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and then sometimes the answer comes, no. <laughs> no, why not? I'm protecting you. And by the way, we pray and God says no. I can almost imagine the Lord saying, you don't want to pray for that. You don't want that. <laughs> you do not want me to do that. I've heard it said this way, God will always answer our prayers the same exact way we would if we knew what He knew. And He knows the end from the beginning. And how many times in your life, in my life, have we thanked God, not just for answered prayer, but for unanswered prayer, I mean, oh Lord, thank you so much. I, I keep a prayer journal. By the way, very, uh, uh, I, wa I really want to encourage you, if you don't already, to have a written out prayer list or prayer journal. I've been doing it for over 30 years, and I go back to that prayer journal and that prayer list, and I look at some of the things I prayed for, you know, like 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. 30 years ago, certainly. And <laughs> it's almost like some of them, I, I, I want to delete them. And then I, I realize, wait, the Lord's saying, you remember praying that? Yeah, I remember praying that. Aren't you glad I didn't answer that prayer the way you wanted me to? Yes, Lord, thank you so much. It would have been terrible 
had you answered that prayer the way I wanted you to answer that prayer. So you're either going to get a yes or a no, or thirdly, and I hate this one, you're going to get a wait. I hate to wait. And so do you too. So don't look at me all spiritual like you don't. I hate to, that's, I mean, I'd almost rather have a no than a wait. Because you know what wait means? Wait. (laughs) It means I have to trust and wait on Him, acknowledge Him, trust in Him, lean on Him, and wait for Him to direct me in the way that He would have me to go. It's called the waiting of faith. Sometimes, and I love it when God makes it really clear, so clear that a fool could not err thereof, because I need God to make it that clear. I mean, God, I I really need to know. And sometimes He does. I, I call it Red Sea clear. You know, when the Israelites are there at the you know, Red Sea, they got the Egyptians behind them, certain death. They've got the Red Sea in front of them, certain death. And then Moses puts out the rod, and God opens up and parts the Red Sea, and they walk on dry ground. Listen, I'm standing there. I'm one of the Israelites there. I got the Egyptians there, the Red Sea, and God just parted it. That's pretty clear that God would have me to go uh, through this uh, (laughs) parted Red Sea on dry ground. I mean, pretty clear, right? I I love it when God is Red Sea clear, and sometimes He will deem it fit to be that clear. But there are other times when it is not, and we, we have to just trust Him, and by faith just step out. That's very pleasing to God, because that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things yet unseen. So we don't walk by sight. I mean, I would love it if, you know, God just, I mean, big highlight yellow arrow, go this way. Okay, thank you, Lord. Go this way. Okay, thank you, Lord. Doesn't always work that way. Sometimes God will not show us what He wants us to do until we turn that corner. You know, I love another translation of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, because it basically renders it like this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all of your ways, and He will make your path straight. He will straighten it out. And so, but (laughs) there are those three prerequisites. We have to trust in Him with all of our heart. That requires faith. We cannot lean on our own understanding of the circumstances that we're in. And in all of our ways, we have to acknowledge Him at every turn. Lord, I'm calling on You. I'm trusting in You. I'm looking to You. And when You do that, the Lord says, this is the way. Walk ye in it. One last thought, and we'll close. One one said it this way, when the timing is wrong, God says slow. When you're wrong, God says grow. When the request is wrong, God says no. But when the timing is right, and you're right, and the request is right, God says go. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing His will. In other words, you're going to be given whatever you need to do His will. And may He work in us what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You. 
Lord, I pray for anyone here today or for anyone that might be watching online that is at the crossroads of a major life decision, and they want to know what your will is. Lord, I pray that they would let the peace of God rule in their hearts, make the call, that it would be confirmed by your word, and that you would providentially arrange the circumstances such that they will know that this is the way, and they're to step out and by faith walk in it. In Jesus' name, Amen.